Thank you very much. Steve, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Lee. Um, it's just wonderful uh, to have uh, scientific software, Inc. Uh, and, and HLM um, work it, bundled together with other work that Lee Sai is doing. He's one of the most brilliant educational statisticians, maybe the most, I'm serious. And I'm very, very happy that we're able to talk and think together and try to find some ways of uh, uh, enabling people to do more meaningful analyses of, hi of hierarchical data. Um, and uh, today I want to talk about a long-standing problem in hierarchical models or linear mixed models um, going back way back to agricultural research uh, variance components. How do we estimate variance components? How do we make inferences about uh, variance components? How do we reflect our uncertainty through testing and, con and particularly confidence interval? And so in that, uh, so with that sort of uh, hyper ambitious title, uh, I'm going to, uh, focus on a very simple idea that I think can help us uh, along the way. And uh, be, I think many of you, I'm hoping that many of you will find it useful. Um, so let me say that, and, and, I, and I suspect that this is an HLM audience, no one would disagree with the assertion that variance components are important. Um, and so why do I say that? Well. Give me, let me give you some examples. Suppose we have a multi-site trial. I'm very interested in these right now. So we have, so I'll talk later about the, the National Head Start Impact Study, which 317 local sites, uh, people apply in their, as a lottery and they're randomly assigned to be an experimental control group in, in these 317 sites. The curricula of these uh, sites vary. Uh, the teacher background, skills vary. There's lots of difference, difference in implementation. There is no one uh, intervention called Head Start, and, and, and yet we want to learn about Head Start programs. We're thinking heterogeneity, okay? We're thinking about variable treatment effects. Each of those 317 sites is giving us a, a randomized trial. It's almost like a planned meta-analysis of, um, uh, of 317 experiments. How do we combine those and we want to know how variable those effects are. Like, there's been, a, you know, in the experimental work in education, there's been such a focus on the average, the mean. What's the average treatment effect? Of course, getting that right is so important. I might add that we have to think hard about what average we're talking about, an average across people, an average across sites. You know, there are different averages. But um, the average is important, but the average alone can be extraordinarily misleading. Um, you could have a modestly positive treatment effect on average, um, but if there was enough heterogeneity, there would, be, there would be some sites where kids are actually being harmed by the new program, as well as some sites where things are going really well. So just to say, well, you should, you should, do, you should do this program when it's a multiplicity of programs having different effects, that's not going to work. So we need to think about how variable these things are. Um, uh, other examples abound in, in hierarchical linear models. So one of the ones that, um, that Tony Brake and I have been interested in and for a long time, um, how much do children, children's learning rates vary across schools? You know, so probably a lot of you have seen this in, in our book and other papers that we've written. There's been a lot of work on um, school means and how school means differ. How do district means differ? But uh, what we really want to know is uh, our kids learning. And, and so, so on average, there could be a different learning, average learning rate in each and every school. How much do they actually vary? That's a crucially important question. Um, I mean, they might, and, and what we found is that they vary a lot. They, a lot of the variability in learning rates is between schools. You know, what does it mean? It could be causal, uh, as a function of what the school people are doing. It could come from other sources. But uh, knowing that answer to that question is crucial. So variance components are really, really important, um, and not only are they important for themselves. They're important because other things we carry about, care about depend on our belief about the variance components. So we might be interested in site-specific estimates, um, particular uh, schools, and when, want to know what the learning rate of that school is, like a value-added model or a teacher. Um, but we got to get the variance right, or we won't get the right answer to this question. Um, the same thing with the, with the, uh, the treatment effects. Um, uh, we, we want to know whether this particular implementation of Head Start works well, but uh, it turns out you really have to have some 
a good idea about the variance components in order to um, uh, make that inference. And, and we, we want some sensitivity analysis. We want to know when we say, make inferences about particular schools or particular sites, how sensitive are those in, inferences to the uncertainty that we have about the variance components? So that leads to then the question of current methods of obtaining confidence intervals for variance components. And here, this is really kind of weird because these models have been around, become very popular since the mid eighties. A lot of people around the world working on these things. And really the, 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 the methods that we have, and I'd be interested in your thoughts, uh, we're gonna have some Q and A. Uh, the methods that we have for drawing inferences about these things that really aren't very good on, uh, in general. I mean, in some cases they work, some cases they don't, it's a problem. So we're gonna talk about that. And uh, then we're going to propose um, the main idea for today, which is exact confidence intervals using the grid search, just a computational brute force. Um, and I'll, we're going to talk about how that works and, and how you can learn a lot of stuff from that. Uh, and uh, associated with the grid search are some graphical sensitivity, graphical assessments so, so that we can actually do the sensitivity analysis. Uh, well, we'll, we'll, and I'll show, I'm going to show, so we got excited about this and put this into version eight of HLM. So we'll show you how, um, how to do this stuff in HLM. It's, it's very, very simple. Okay. Uh, so let's just start a little bit, go into a little more detail on, on the multi-site trial and how variable are the treatment effects. So in a recent paper, Howard Bloom, Mike Weiss, and I, Kristen Porter wrote a paper in the Journal of Research on Educational Effectiveness. And we, we came up with three displays of, of uh, the, the distribution, the histogram and the treatment effects. Uh, probably the most uh, immediate one that you would think of is, is at the top. By the way, this is from the um, National Welfare to Work study. It was this, a national experiment designed to see whether um, a, a kind of welfare to work model would increase the, would, would increase the earnings of uh, low income mothers. Um, actually a very, very important study. Uh, it, it's an interesting study with, with 59 sites and 60,000 subjects, so almost a, on average 1,000 people per site. So you'd think you'd have very, very good estimates of the treatment effect in each and every site, but not necessarily. So the top uh, histogram is literally the site-specific estimate of the treatment effect, just the mean difference between the experimental and control group. And you can see you look at the scale, I don't know if you can see it. It's about, it's centered around 800 to 900, maybe $1,000 uh, a year average impact, which is, you know, not trivial. Uh, it's not huge, but it's not trivial. But there's there's so much heterogeneity, right? I mean, look at these sites. It looks like in, in some cases, oh my God, here's a site where you lose $2,400 a year. Another site where you gain 4,000. Well, we can't believe that histogram because it's got noise. Even with a lot of people per site, there's a lot of noise in these estimates, it turns out. Not a lot, but there's enough to, to make this. This is an exaggerated picture of variability, right? I guess you all know that. Just estimate the, the we call it beta hat, but it's really just the, it's the mean of the experimental group minus the mean of the control. Just do the histogram. Um, some of those extreme values are, are chance deviate, you know, to do attributable, we believe, to chance. You know, these, some of these up here are just kind of chance uh, extreme. Maybe, maybe those are some of the ones with the smaller sites. They were they popped up here and they popped down here. So what you're used to looking at, probably if you use HLM, are the empirical Bayes estimates, right? These are sh shrunken estimates. If, if you're unreliable because you have a small sample and you're out there, we're going to shrink you in. We're going to pull you in because... You know, we think depending on how unreliable it is, and each site has its own reliability. This is in chapter three of our of our book. This is like one of the most you know important innovations in having hierarchical linear models. And so we have this this histogram at the bottom, and and uh, and and these are the best point estimates that we have for each of these. But interestingly enough, these point estimates, this this histogram, as a as a collective it underestimates the variation. These are less variable than, than what we think is, is really happening. The middle one is sort of the, uh, I guess the Goldilocks distribution. It's, it's um, the dis this distribution is based on the maximum likelihood estimator of the, um, of the variance. This, this is the unbiased estimator and it's kind of between these two. And we see in study after study that that's true. And as, as typical, this, this one, the middle one is, is um, closer to the bottom one typically than the top. So the shrinkage estimators give you 
a better picture of the collection than does the just these simple uh, site by site estimates. But the but the the unbiased estimator of the of the uh, of the distribution, the whole distribution, not of each one, but the whole distribution comes from maximum likelihood. But 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 what are what about those maximum likelihood estimates? Do we have a confidence interval on those things? You know, this is all based on on a point estimate of that, you know, and so that point estimate might be uncertain. So what are we gonna do? That's really what we're talking about today. School variation, and so that's one example of an application of, uh, of a variance component because, and, and the basic point I'm trying to make is that to understand the, to get a good picture of the treatment effect in any site, you need some sense of how heterogeneous the, the treatment effects are overall, and if you if and, and but that's a point estimate. How uncertain are we? What is it, what's the confidence interval for that? So another example, I mentioned the school variation in learning rates. So here's an example: sixty Chicago elementary schools. You've probably seen this. It's in chapter eight, I think, of our book. So this is not a new example. Growth in mathematics achievement grades two through six. Tony Brake and I wrote this. Uh, did this thing and. We found the average growth rate in Chicago was um, across these, these representative schools was about 0.76. This is an elogic metric. So that's about how much kids learn per year, which is an increase in the log odds of a correct answer. It's hard to interpret a little bit, but 0.76. And the, the school variance, so how much do the schools vary in their growth rates? Estimate 0.106 squared. And, and the question is, is that a big number or a small number? And we, and we reason it's a, it's a big number. <laughs> And, and, um, and uh, why? Because, well, we, we came up with this idea, maybe you, many of you may have seen this, the 95% plausible value interval. If the schools have, if the, if the average learning rates across these 60 schools, each school has a learning rate, right? And there's 60 of them. And we're, we're making an inference to the populations of schools. So if that population is, has a normal distribution of learning rates, and that's, you know, that's an if, of course. But if that were true, wouldn't we expect, expect 95% of those would be within this um, number? I see a little typo here. It should be 0 0.763 plus or minus 1.96 times 0 0.106. We, this is the standard deviation. This is just the multiplier for the normal distribution. So we'd expect 95% of the schools to have school average learning rates between 0.56 and 0.97. <clears throat> That's a vast difference. That's an annual learning rate. We're talking about a, a, the, best, the, the highest learning rate schools, kids are, kids are learning 75% more than the lowest ones. That's assuming all the learning rates are positive, which is reasonable. Okay, so that's a huge, so we use these, these plausible value intervals to give us a sense of what does it mean to have a tau of 0.106 squared? Well, in the context of, of the mean of 0.763, it shows that there's, if we believe that, if we believe the 0.106, you know, that's the point estimate. But, you know, we want to know, is that a good point estimate? What's the confidence interval? Maybe it's not, you know, maybe it could be really small. Maybe it could be really big. Maybe not. So we really need these confidence intervals, right? Um, <clears throat> and I mentioned um, the sensitivity. Uh, we're not only interested in the variance components in themselves, they have sociological or scientific in, uh, interest. But, um, but other things depend on them. So we wanna know, so that's, that's another reason. Okay, so that's the idea. I mentioned this. Okay, so what are the current applications? Like what do people do nowadays? I mean, after like literally after what? 35 years of doing this stuff or 40 or however many, maybe, maybe it goes back even further. Um, uh, I think it's basically three things that people do. To, do, to, to assess uncertainty. And usually they do tests, not necessarily confidence intervals. Again, if, you got, if I'm wrong, you guys are gonna bring me up to date. Um, so one test is called a wall test. Take the estimate of the variance co component and call that tau hat, divide it by its standard error. And what would, that, that seems kind of crazy for a variance, uh, but, but it's justified by the central limit theorem. It says that, if tau hat is a maximum likelihood estimator, then in <clears throat> large enough samples, it has an asymptotic normal distribution and therefore it's symmetric. Uh, it has a symmetric uh, sampling distribution and um, we can use maximum likelihood to estimate tau hat and standard error just, and if that number is greater than some criterion like two or something, then we say it's significant. Well, we're gonna, 
you probably know this is generally not a good idea to do this. Um, it works sometimes, but uh, we'll have an example where it works pretty well, and then another one where it works really badly. <laughs> so this this is a general rule, and you could you could easily say, well, let's make a confidence interval out of this thing. The confidence interval is going to be separate, centered on the center tau hat, and then we're going to go out. We're going to have a symmetric confidence interval, right? Okay. But symmetric confidence intervals don't usually work. When they, well, they sometimes do, but they don't generally work. Is the point? Um, okay. So that's one thing people do. Another thing people do is um, they do a likelihood ratio test. So let's run a model in which the variance is assumed to be zero. Okay. That's just a straight low LS model. Then we'll run an HLM type model where the variance is in the model. We'll compare the fit of the two models. We get a deviant statistic that gives us a likelihood ratio. The only problem is it's not a chi-square <laughs> because you're testing at the boundary of the parameter space. So the likelihood ratio test gives you um, a more complicated sampling distribution than the chi-square. It's a mixture of chi-squares and so forth, but uh, it, it doesn't necessarily behave well at the boundary. So, uh, and, and it's not clear, how do you get a confidence symbol out of it? Okay, that's a test only. So it's just, is it zero or not? You know, we wanna know more than that. We wanna know what are the plausible values of that tower? And we just know whether it's zero or not, that's not enough. And then something we've been doing in HLM <clears throat> that's very, straightforward and actually works very, we think very well, which is called Q statistic. It just says, take the estimate of the, let's call it, let's pretend we're in the, uh, okay, we're in the uh, head start case, beta hat J is, is the treatment effective estimate and site J. And um, <clears throat> take that estimate, subtract the mean, square it, divide by the sampling variance of that estimate. Uh, do not include the tau part, just the sampling variance part. If tau is zero, this thing is going to be a central chi-square. If tau is not zero, that means the denominator is too small because we should be adding the variability between sites in the true, in the true estimate. So this thing's going to blow up. It's going to blow up when uh, the null hypothesis is, is false. So that's kind of what we use in HLM. When you look at the chi-square statistic, in HLM, that's kind of what we're doing there. And we've, we've got some reason to believe it works pretty well. It is based on normal theory. And, and people may prefer a, uh, some people definitely prefer a uh, bootstrap interval. You can do that, uh, other kinds of intervals, but we're just gonna stick with the Q statistic for today. So, okay, so summary, what do we got? Well, we've got a wall test that uh, assumes con uh, symmetric sampling distribution, which uh, as we're gonna see, doesn't necessarily work well. We've got a likelihood ratio test that doesn't work well at the boundary, which is zero. Uh, necessarily and, and doesn't give you a confidence interval. And we got a Q statistic um, that just still answers the question about the, uh, the null hypothesis, but doesn't give us a confidence interval, okay? So that's kind of, I think that's where we are, folks. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe with, the, with the, now if you're doing a Bayesian and you're in a posterior distribution, uh, we can talk about that. Um, but uh, so, so here's the simple idea for today. It's called a grid search. Okay, it says we're going to test the null hypothesis, not that tau is e well, not, that tau is equal to zero by hypothesis tau is equal to zero, or I'm sorry, is equal to c c some constant for every constant greater than zero, just for one of those, just pick a constant c, compute the q statistic. If c is too small, q is going to blow up. If it's too large, Q is going to be too small. So actually, the chi-square can have two sides. You know, we don't often look at the left side, but it's a there's a it's a two-sided test. There's a um, you can have a a chi-square that's significantly less than um, uh, what you would expect <laughs> if it were a central chi-square. So, and we're going to repeat that test for every C greater than zero, uh, greater than or equal to zero. We're going to include zero. We're going to zero and every. Well, what do you mean? So we're not going to do every one. There's an infinite, obviously an infinite, uh, an uncountably infinite number of uh, 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 non-negative numbers. But we're going to search the. We're going to search, and we're going to we're using some knowledge that we have about um, you know the the um, the shape of the likelihood that we can just get from looking at the likelihood. We're going to we're going to get uh, we're going to look. At, we're going to zero in on, on uh, the endpoints of the confidence interval. And, and the basic idea though is, is, is kind of amazing. You know, it's simple, I guess, maybe some of you know about this. 
the values of C that for which we retain the null, then that's the confidence, right? Those are the plausible values, the ones where we don't reject. So we compute every Q and like in principle, an infinite number of Qs. The ones that we don't reject, those, that's the confidence. Right? That's the grid search. Okay. So now we have an exact confidence. Level. It's under normality because the chi, Q is not a chi square unless uh, beta hat has normal distribution. So that's something to think about. But we could use, we could substitute other things. The key idea is the grid search. We need to do this for every possible C. We can't do it really for every C. We're gonna, but we're gonna have, uh, we're gonna zero in on the on the on the endpoints of that conference. Uh, that's what we're gonna do. All right. So uh, I don't know if you guys, if you have, if I'm being unclear or something, or need need clarification, shoot a question. I'm happy to be. In, I'm I'm at a university where I'm constantly being interrupted. It seems a little weird to be up here, but not being interrupted, but that's okay. Uh, all right, head start impact study. So very simple, um, TIJ treatment indicator is a one if student I in school J is assigned to head start, a zero at control. YIJ is gonna be, we're gonna do two, we're gonna do this twice, once for reading as an outcome, early reading, these little three and four year old kids, and once for the Peabody picture vocabulary test, you probably know that's a vocabulary test. Those are two important things. They're not the same. Um, you can learn some of the um, decoding skills, some letter recognition, uh, sound out word, sound out letters, and begin to sound out some words and recognize some words, and have some early reading. But the book, the vocabulary is also important for your uh, for your learning to become a good comprehender later on because you have a big vocabulary, you have a, a lot of concepts, and you've got words for those concepts, and you're going to be able to uh, uh, you're going to be able to understand a lot more text. Um, so we're interested in both of those. Okay, so we'll do those two things. Um, it's going to be just the relationship between T and Y in each site. We're not having any covariance. I'm just keeping it real simple. I love simplicity. It's great. Um, we can make it more complicated if we want to. Um, but if we can understand the simple case, we can, we can go somewhere. 317 sites, um, which are pretty representative of the, all the Head Start centers in the United States, the National Head Start Impact Study. 2010, 3,593 kids. And by the way, an interesting thing about Head Start, a lot of the sites are really tiny, really small numbers. Um, and so we, we, you can, I mean, divide, you, you can see that, you know, like, uh, you know, 20, less than 20 per site. In fact, there's only about an average about 11 per site. 11 or 12 per site, and some of the sites are really small. So that's a problem, but we're gonna, we're gonna deal with it. And that's gonna generate some of the, one of the reasons I picked this, that generates a lot of uncertainty about tau, okay? So let's see if we can solve, this is a hard problem to solve, let's see if we can solve it. Our model is real simple, standard HLM model, except with one little, one little tweak, and I don't know if any of you were at my last uh, webinar, but we're kind, of, we're kind of, in these studies, we're kind of looking at this, uh, fixed intercept random coefficient model. Um, we could have a random intercept, but um, it might possibly bring some bias into things. And I talked about that last uh, webinar and uh, the Bloom, the paper with Bloom and Weiss talks about this. So, and the, and the fixed intercept random intercept model uh, simplifies things. We're only gonna have a random slope. So the way it works is, oh yeah, at level one, here's your outcome for student nine school J is equal to an intercept. Um, plus a, um, uh, a, the, the slope for T, T is just this binary indicator being in the treatment group, there's gonna be a within site variance. By the way, in these experiments, you need to explore whether there need to be more than one variance. We don't, we, we, in Head Start, one variance is, is fine. We don't need more. We really look hard at that. Um, you might, for example, think, well, the, maybe the treatment group has less variance than the control group. Um, there's theory behind that, but it, it just didn't pan out here. Um, okay, so the beta zero J is gonna be set to a fixed constant. And we have a way of doing that amazingly efficiently in HLM. No dummy variables, no centering. That was the last webinar. So if you weren't there, um, it's pretty cool. We're happy about it. Okay, so then, then really focus on the beta one J, that's the treatment effect in site J, which is equal to um, a, a grand mean gamma one O plus A random effect of treatment with the variance tau. Well, that should be a tau one one, I see. That was a mistake. I'll fix these things. 
these typos get really big when you're when you're looking at when you're giving the talk. Okay, <laughs> it's the variance of the treatment effects. Okay, so here's here's a screenshot of this should look pretty familiar. This you start with a standard HLM model. Okay, um, reading is the outcome, uh, intercept slope, and then you have the uh, intercept varies around the mean, slope varies around the mean. But what we do to in, impose this fixed random this fixed intercept is um, we, we just go to uh, other estimation settings and click this little thing, fixed intercept random coefficients. No dummy variables, no centering, and it's instantaneous. Um, it's a trick computationally that uh, I talked about last time. I won't go into it now unless there's a question, but we can, it's quite interesting. Um, so then what happens is then your model looks like this. You've got the same level one model, but your level, mon your level two model says that the intercept is equal to, and this is actually a fixed constant. It's not a zero mean thing at all. It's just a fixed constant. And then here's the model for the treatment effect. Okay. Now, in order to get this grid search, uh, we got to go to uh, also go to other estimations. We, we click on something on profile likelihood. I'm going to show you um, what that is in, in a few minutes. It sounds fancy, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's a cool idea. Uh, and then you click the confidence interval grid search. And, and here's, here's kind of a limitation right now. We're working on generalizing this right now. It's only good for a scalar random effect. So if you have a, a variance of tau as a variance covariance matrix, we're not there yet. Um, but of course, using the fixed intercept random coefficient model, we only have one variance, we're okay. So we're a little bit limited there, but we're, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna come along. We're gonna come back at you with, uh, with something. It's gonna be more challenging to have a matrix, but we're gonna, we're gonna do that. We're going to do it pretty soon. Okay. Um, all right. So here's the results. Here's the results of the HLM analysis. Um, the treatment effect is uh, 5.6. That's point estimate. Uh, standard error is about one. So we get a very, you know, a very high, a large T value. So we can easily reject the null that there's uh, there's no effect of uh, of head start, and we infer. The effect on average is positive on reading. So being assigned at random to hit, and this is just being assigned at random. So there's non-compliance, there's stuff going on here. So that's that's interesting. And that's about 0.18, I think 18% of a standard deviation in that neighborhood, somewhere between 18, between 16 and 20% of a standard deviation. Not a huge effect, but it's pretty good size effect. And uh, um, because of the non-compliance, it actually is bigger than you think. Um, for the kids who actually um, follow the regime that they're assigned to. <laughs> um, okay, uh, it, we always give you these robust standard errors, right? And you can see the robust standard error is almost virtually identical to the model-based standard error. This is something you'll see in HLM over and over again. We give you the, the robust standard error doesn't depend on the normality assumption, doesn't depend on homoscedasticity, et cetera. And we, we like it when, uh, the model base and robust are, are very similar. So we get the same thing. And then for the variance component, it's kind of interesting. We get this estimate, 44.68. Uh, standard deviation of 6.68, which is a pretty big number actually, because it means that like if you were one standard deviation above average, right, your, 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 your treatment effect would be 5.6 plus 6.6 would be up in the neighborhood of 12, which would be up 40% of the standard deviation, right? So it's a pretty big number. However, the uncertainty is great because the chi-square doesn't even quite make it to significance using our Q statistic, right? And that's largely because of the, the really minuscule sample sizes in many, many, many of these sites. So we have this uncertainty. So now we really have this uncertainty. Uh, the point estimate's big, but the, um, um, the uncertainty is pretty large, okay? Um, and so, so how are we gonna, what are we gonna do about that? Well, uh, oh, grid search. Here's our grid search, way up at the top, here's our grid search confidence interval. These are the numbers, everything between zero and 87, um, which is a plausible value of, uh, according to our grid search um, for tau. So, um, and those are variances. So, you know, 87 is like a little more than 0.9, right, squared. Um, so, um, uh, so that kind of does to constrain how big we think the treatment effects might be. Maybe they're not up to 12. That's not quite right. So, uh, so we'll see. Uh, so maybe that 95% plausible value interval was a little too big um, uh, because we based it 
on uh, a point estimate that was very uncertain. Okay, so we learned something. Um, now I want you to look at this. So the estimate of tau was was 44.7. Okay, let me see if I can get my cursor over here somewhere. There it is, 44.7. The standard error was 22.8, which is about half, right? It's about half the point estimate. You doing the nine doing the naive thing and just treating it tau hat as symmetric around tau with that standard error. The model-based standard error, which I said was a bad idea, was was zero to zero to eighty nine point four, and our grid search was zero to eighty seven point one. It's almost the same. The model-based standard error worked really really well. The wall test, right? Just take the tau hat and the standard error, compute a symmetric confidence interval, and it worked great. So what the hell am I talking about? Why are we going through all this trouble when, okay, but let's look at PPVT, all right? Take a look at PPVT. Here, and is a different scale for PPVT. So uh, these numbers are not uh, on the same scale. Um, it's more of a standardized kind of scale. So the estimate of tau is 1.61. And by the way, the, 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 average, the on average uh, Head Start boosted, um, on average, Head Start boosted P PVT by about 0.18 standard deviation. So the average effect in terms of standard deviation units was really, really similar, okay? But look at the standard error. For the, this is not for the treatment effect. This is for the variance, right? The tau is the variance. Standard error, bigger. And look at the 95% model-based confidence interval is symmetric from negative 2.23 up to 3.84. Well, now we're living in la-la land because we, you can't have a negative variance. See, this is where, this is where the wild method runs into trouble. Negative variances do not make any sense. The, the parameter space for tau, it has to be a non, it has to be a, a non-negative real number, right? So that confidence interval is meaningless. And the grid search is giving us something that we think is exact, at least under the normality assumption, everything from zero up to 5.32. Okay, so that means, and one thing you can see, the right-hand side is bigger than we might have thought. So 3.84 looks like the upper limit. I'm using the condition, the traditional method, but but that's that's too small. But the lower bound, of course, is zero, which it has to be. It can't be less than zero. Uh, and, and so so that's what we're seeing. Okay, so now you can kind of see why, um, the, you know, at least I'm going to argue that the grid search is generally applicable, gives you useful information. And um, whereas the traditional methods can be, if, and, and, and the basic, we know the reason for this. When the tau hat is big enough, far enough from the, the boundary of zero, uh, the central limit theorem kicks in, it works nicely, and you get this nice normal sam sampling distribution approximately normal of the tau hat estimate. With 317 sites, we get that. But as you move closer to the boundary, that, cement, that symmetry and that central limit theorem, you need gigantic, <laughs> the closer you get to zero, you need gigantic numbers of sites before, you, the, before the central limit theorem kicks in and you get any kind of symmetry in that thing. All right, so we think the grid search basically works uh, pretty much all the time, but it is, it is under normality, but again, if you don't like that, we, we can do other things, but the, you can still use the grid search. Okay. All right. Let's, let's, uh, Steve, could I interrupt? Uh, yeah, yeah, one please. Yeah, go ahead. I, I think that you made a, a very interesting point that actually is related to also one of the QA questions. So the question states uh, the context here is children in schools. I imagine I can apply this to daily repeated measurements in patients. Could I also use for patients in disease subconditions, for example, different expressions of Parkinson's, et cetera? Um, you know, at least the first part of the daily repeated measurements uh, is, is, uh, is interesting because the, the, the model setup um, that mathematically they look the same, but the dimensions of the data may be very different uh, when you, you know, compare these kinds of models where you have students nested within sites um, versus uh, uh, Daily repeated measurements nested within the individuals. So that's that was that was a question in the Q and A. 
Yeah, that's a great question. And I and it, it certainly is applicable. I mean, right now you have to you have to kind of figure out how to uh, make this a, only a scaler, uh, but you can do that. You can have fixed effects of people and then let their their growth rates uh, vary uh, if it's linear. If it gets to be too high dimensional, then you have to wait a little bit for us <laughs> to generalize this. But yes, no, it works on this. And I've actually done it on the uh, uh, the Chicago data where the kids, the average learning rate of the kids in the schools, and, and it works. Um, but I do. I think that's a great point about the, the structure. So typically, in a um, repeated measures context, where level one are occasions and level two are people, we usually in most of the data sets I've seen, we don't have a lot of uh, level one units per level two. Although the, the, this is changing now with big data, so we're, we're getting these big data sets that have these very fine grained, uh, you know, uh, what are they called? momentary assessments and so forth. You know, we're getting into that. And so, but uh, let's just say that you have a more traditional sort of repeated measures where you have annual assessments, let's say, um, or every six months people come into the, come into the hospital and, and, and get checked. And we're looking at the growth rate of their, uh, you know, their PSA or their something, whatever it might be. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, you might think, well, since we often have very few measurements per person, maybe the, the tau estimates are gonna be highly uncertain but not necessarily uh, for two reasons. One is people may be very heterogeneous, in which case the central limit theorem might kick in well. The other one is if the level one model, even though if you have a few, a small number of uh, observations, if it fits well, if it's a good, if you have a good prediction model at level one, you don't need as many data points per level two unit. So I have an example of that with gro the growth of vocabulary children during the second year of life. We have that in, in our book. And we have now data on kids and vocabulary up to the age of 15. But my colleagues do, um, Susan Golden Meadow and Susan Levine. Um, but the it turns out that age is an incredibly, especially for the little kids, an incredibly good predictor of vocabulary. So you get you get very, very good fit within people. So even if you don't have a lot of observations, you get actually a very precise tau. So don't be discouraged about small numbers of um, cases per person if particularly if the level one model fits well but yes these are this method is applicable to any and in the hlm you can do this in two level models three level models cross classified models you can have uh, you know neighborhoods uh, how much do they vary or you can have schools you right now you can't have both but we're working on that uh, um, okay and related so, steve there's a, there's a sure. second question uh, which is uh, uh, about the, the current approach, uh, as described, applies for the linear case. Um, can we do this for nonlinear link functions? Yes, that's what I'm asking. Absolutely, and we can. I mean, the nice thing about grid search is, see, here's why it's really cool. But uh, again, let's. And by the way, most of the applications I've seen of binomial, uh, random, uh, uh, let's say, call them um, hierarchical logistic regression. Okay, where you have a binary outcome. Um, uh, and uh, let's say you have kids are going to graduate from high school or they're not, and, and they're nested in schools or something like that. Um, the, uh, the, the hard part of that, of that analysis is to estimate the variance. Uh, and that's why we have fancy things like um, adaptive gauss hermy quadrature, the Laplace, the higher order Laplace approximations, and other things that are very challenging. The grid search actually grotesquely, amazingly simplifies everything. It's because you say, I'm just going to, let's say if, if the variance, the scalar, and most of these, by the way, have, that I've seen published, I have scalar variances. So if that scalar variance is a certain constant, then it's literally just like est estimating a standard logistic regression and change the constant and estimate and let do it over and over again. And you, and you get a precise answer. You don't, you don't get something that's kind of okay because the, 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 uh, because the integral was only approximate because we didn't use enough quadrature points or we didn't have a higher order enough Laplace or, you know, like literally it just, <laughs> it cleans everything up. It's just such a simple idea. Of course, um, it, again, it is, it's just right now it's limited to scale, but we're, we're working on it. But I, I'm actually particularly excited about the, the nonlinear application for so that's a great question. Um, you know, I mean, the convergence of this is so fast when you have, uh, uh, when, you, when you know the value of tau and then you just estimate the regression coefficients. It's like three iterations and, and then you, you change the value of tau and you do it again. You just do these things really quickly. So it works pretty well. Okay, so 
Yeah, great. So yeah, get any more and just keep keep them coming. I like the questions. In fact, I'm really almost out of anything I'm going to say here. We can open that up uh, really quick. Uh, I do want to show you um, uh, some graphics that I think uh, take a little time to um, to sort of understand this graphic. This is a profile likelihood, but I think um, if you can kind of get your head around what this is, you can really understand what's going on. So this is the profile likelihood for the first uh, for for reading. And so here are the plausible values of tau from the grid search. They go from zero up to remember, 87 point something, close to, close to 88. So that's the 95% confidence interval, right? Associated with every one of those uh, points of tau is a what we call a profile likelihood. It's how plausible uh, is that value? Um, uh, it's basically, um, you estimate all the other parameters and you say, well, how, how likely is that uh, are, is that set of results given the sample that we've actually collected? And so the ones, as you can see, that are very, very small have le less plausibility. The ones that are that are very high have more plausibility. The 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 mode of the of the of the profile likelihood is always the same as the mode of the actual likelihood that we're usually maximizing. And but this shape of this gives you so much information because in reading, remember that was the one that behaved well even under the uh, traditional methods. Well, look at the shape of this thing. It's it's unimodal. It's symmetric. It uh, zero is plausible. Is it is ex plausible? But it's not that plausible. <laughs> it's it's part of it's in the ninety five, but it's it's not very likely. And and what we've graphed in the background, this thing that looks like a bullet or looks like a bunch of whiskers growing out, is our belief about the site specific estimates. Uh, the 317 sites. There's literally 317 of those lines, those black lines. Of course, if we think tau is zero, that means the variability of the treatment effects is zero. Then every, then we think, then we know all the truth. All, every every site has truly the same effect. <laughs> it, you know, and we can't totally reject that because we had a p equals 0.06 thing. And if you, you know, depending on your criterion, it's not really very plausible. Uh, as as the tau gets bigger. Uh, the empirical Bayes estimates grow apart. They get farther and farther apart because, you know, we're shrinking less and less. And uh, because we think uh, there's, there's really some heterogeneity there. Um, and, and in the extreme case, we see, um, you know, at the far right side, we see the most variability. Um, I'm trying to find my recursor. There it is. Oops, doesn't want to come over here. Here it is, over here. But that's not very plot. That's the far right end. So the, the kind of the meat is here. This is kind of where we think the distribution is. And then there's some variation within that. But so that gives you a sense of the sensitivity of the uh, empirical base estimates to um, the plausibility of, of these tiles, you know, which are kind of located in the, the meat of it here. And we wouldn't have that. We wouldn't be able to do that unless we had a really exact or very close to an uh, estimate. And when I say exact, only to certain decimals. If you want to make it more exact, you just keep try, trying finer and finer grains around, right around the boundaries, right? Try numbers that are really close to each other here, really close to each other here, and you get more and more, more and more accuracy to more and more decimals, and it just takes a little longer. You know, you can change that. So, um, so this is kind of beautiful, but now you can see from this one why it was that the, the, the traditional method worked so well because of the symmetry, the unimodal symmetric nature of the likelihood, okay? But how did it work in PPVT? No, it didn't work that way, see? PPVT, um, you still have, you have a very high plausibility of zero. It's a very plausible number. So that the... the um, the likelihood is very asymmetric, and the confidence interval is very asymmetric. Uh, the mode was 1.61, which is about here. Right there, you can see there's plenty of plausible values far to the right of the mode. There's no, there's symmetry here does not make sense. So that's why the conventional methods don't work uh, when you have um, when you have when zero becomes a, a more plausible number. Um, and by the way, a lot of times people say, well, if zero is a plausible, if zero is, uh, is, it could be even the maximum likelihood estimate, or at least we're not, re we're not rejecting it. So that we're going to assume that the, that the treatment effect has no variability. Well, that's a mistake. That's a mistake because zero, although a plausible value is, is, um, is the most extremely small of all the plausible. There's plenty of other plausible values that are higher. They, they, in fact, um, actually, the MLE was uh, 1.61, I said. I said. Uh, so 
uh, you didn't, so even though you, re, even though you retained the null hypothesis and that null hypothesis does have plausibility, it's not a great summary of the evidence because it's at the extreme end of all of the plausible values, right? So you can see that from this graph. So these, I find that these graphs are incredibly helpful. They tell you what's going on. They tell you, you know, when, when they tell you when, uh, when the uh, traditional methods work and, and why. Um, of course, when you start seeing negative um, estimates, then you know you're, you, that's, that's like when the clock strikes 13, right? You don't believe, it. it's not that you don't believe it's 13 o'clock, it just means you, you don't believe the clock, you throw the clock away, right? So, <laughs> so we don't want to have those kind of methods that give us those kind of numbers. Um, unless we see, you know, if we see this, then we know, well, yeah, actually, the clock, the clock, this clock works some of the time, but you know, here the clock is underwater, it doesn't work. <laughs> So that's really pretty much all I had to say. I think we got some time to open it up. I'm happy to hear what you have to say, comments, questions, rude remarks of any kind. Wonderful, thank you, Steve. And again, uh, just for the attendees, feel free to either use the chat box or use the Q&A tool um, to raise questions. I always worry if there aren't questions because it means I was too convincing. <laughs> we know when we send this out for review that people are going to disagree with it, but uh, <laughs> but I, I made the case. Some people said someone said I should be a used car salesman. I really am not trying to do that. I just want to make the point clear. But you know, <laughs> so you guys. But I, I really think I like this approach. Um, it has a number of additional uses outside of the uh, multi-level modeling context where various components are you know, an integral part of the model and then the inferences about the various components will have downstream effects on the quality of the inference that we make for the regression coefficient-like parameters. In, in IRT, for example, there, uh, there's the, the distinction of various components or most routinely, we estimate square roots of various components and then uh, intercepts as well. Right, and those are um, those are your estimates of the skill of child and our belief about how. Uh, uh, and and of course, I guess yeah. I, of course, usually those are standardized. They have mean zero, standard deviation one. But I guess what would what would if you get that wrong? So so Lee, let me ask you: What happens if you get the variance wrong? Like badly wrong in, uh, in, a, in a simple IRT model? Well, in a Roche model, if in fact you have, let's say, the case of very little variability, and you're in fact forcing this, this uh, variance component, it, it would get a very poor slope estimate. And yeah. in that case, um, the intercepts will likely be more severely biased. And having plots like the one that you have on the screen could be very helpful there. I've, I haven't really seen one. And the reason most likely is because in educational measurement, the sample sizes tend to be quite a bit larger. And the, the models uh, have certain kinds of structure where if you see a problem, then perhaps some of the items get thrown out. But so, certainly not the case here, you know, where you have this very nice whisker of uh, um, a single point for your regression parameter, and then uh, everything that is site specific, and then there's no shrinkage. And then you superimpose that curve on top, which gives you a very nice sense of the region over which the, uh, the plausibility of those various component may be. Right. Yeah, so Dan Schwartz is a as an advanced uh, doctoral student here in biostatistics at Chicago, and he and I are working on a paper on Head Start. And we're looking at these kind of things. We're looking at the the implications of these things for for uh, research design, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, getting good estimates of these things uh, has a has an effect on how you would design a study as well as um, and and of course it has. A, we plotted here. We only plotted the empirical Bayes estimates. We could easily plot other uh, like what's the effect of, uh, uh, of having, let's say, the high school curriculum versus some other um, 
versus let's say the creative, uh, what is it, creative, the creative curriculum, I think it's called, the one that's most, the biggest one in Head Start. You know, you can, this is extremely contentious, you know, to see whether those things would be uh, sensitive to these things. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, no, I, and if anyone has ideas about how to uh, do this rapidly for uh, the, multi, the matrix case, uh, Lee and I are already, are already exchanging ideas. I'm talking to some friends and we're gonna, we're gonna make this more general uh, so you can have two variances, three variances, and and you could look at one. You could look at them in one dimension at a time. You could look at the. You could look at two at a time. It's a little hard to look at a three dimensional plot and really understand it. Four dimensions becomes impossible almost. But um, uh, so that. But usually in a study, my advice has been to people is. You need to have a focus. Don't try to ask, don't focus on too many things at the same time. So so we would tend to focus on the sensitivity. The, sense of the key variance components and the sensitivity of the key inferences. In this case, of course, the variance, the treatment effect is the absolute um, most important um, parameter determining our belief about any the inference that's happening in, in any particular site or of any regression coefficient. Steve, on a practical point, um, perhaps we should also point out that this analysis will differ slightly from the regular analysis in that there will be multiple command prompt windows opening as this is done and that the number of times you actually see these boxes open will correspond to the number of points you select on the profile like you dialog box. Yeah, we can go back to that. Uh, let me, in fact, that's a good idea since we're talking about HLM here. Um, uh, the, uh, yeah, so we, when we do the graphs, we graph, uh, 12 divisions, but we have to try a lot more numbers to get to that. Um, but, um, uh, we find that 12, you know, that if, if you have a lot, if you have 12 line segments joined together, the human eye sees it as a curve. Um, but there's, is, it, is, this, is this relevant to your comment, uh, uh, Matilda? This is what you're gonna see. These yes, are, because you're actually going yeah. to see a new command prompt popping up for each of the number of divisions specified on this box. So it will look as if the program opens and closes, but in oh, right. reality, it is simply performing the necessary steps to produce the profile like you graph. Exactly right, yeah. So when you run this uh, in real time, uh, and uh, it's it has to do it. It actually has to do if if you do both the profile and the confidence interval grid search, it's going to estimate the model at every single. It'll first of all, it's going to estimate the HLM model just the way it always does, and that's going to give a lot of information about where to look for these confidence intervals. Okay, so that's the first thing you're going to see in HLM. You're going to see the old-fashioned regular estimate, and then. You're going to see a series of estimates where uh, on the on the on the screen coming up and the light and iterations uh, at each and every value of uh, tau of C that that within that range that that uh, HLM uh, picks. And interestingly enough, the number of iterations on each one of those tends to be very very small, like three, <laughs> two, three, four iterations. So those go. There are many of those, but they go they go bing bing bing. They go very fast. Um, and then if you want the profile likelihood. I mean the graph, um, then it has to also compute the graph and 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 put those uh, empirical based estimates. So you'll see you'll see this happening. You'll see, I would say it for the okay for this k this data set with 317 sites and with uh, 3,593 kids, uh, it still it only took maybe uh, 10 or 15 seconds, whereas usually HLM would be instantaneous with this. I mean, instant HLM would give you, you know, several hundred iterations if you need them in, a, in almost in a nanosecond, just a couple of seconds, you know, most. And um, this may, you know, of course, I can imagine a, giant, a really huge data set. You could imagine it taking longer, but um, uh, and we, uh, Lee and I, are also talking about how to speed it up. But right now, it's already for these kind of data sets, it's very fast. I mean, you have to be a very impatient person to get upset about <laughs> the way this goes.
So I'm not hearing a lot of questions. Um, and I hope that doesn't uh, uh, indicate the confusion of my presentation. Um, uh, although it might. No, I, I think that, Steve, that just means that you have been very clear and convincing. <laughs> this is a, a very nice approach to go. And uh, uh, so this is in HLM now. Is that right? That's right. It's in the, it's in the current version. And we'll update it soon, you know, as soon as we get, well, I can't say how soon, but we will update it. The other, I, I do want to say, because there's something else. Uh, I know probably a lot of you have, some of you may have um, noticed how um, confusing the literature in multi-level is on, on waiting, multi-level. So we've been doing a lot of work on that. I think the, the next webinar that we're likely to have is probably going to be on waiting. We've done a lot of work on this. And we think that actually, um, we think there's a reason that we and others have been confused. And literature is very, there's many papers on this, they're very complicated, but there's something very simple at the heart, at the root, the root of it. That's what I'm always looking for, this simple explanation for complex stuff, is that people have to be extremely careful about what their target is for their inference in, in order to know not only how to construct the weights, but how to scale them. And, um, and that, that seems to solve a lot of the problems uh, because there's no general approach. If even if you have weights that are given to you by NCES or given to you by somebody, you know, National Longitudinal Study Group, whatever, you're given those weights. If you don't know what you're trying to estimate, like for example, are you estimating in a two-level model with repeated measures on people? You're probably trying to generalize to a population of people. Those are level two. In a um, in Head Start, we could be wanting to estimate a distribution of treatment effects, and we want to know well, what's the distribution on each site. And so that's kind of a natural estimate for HLM, which is the site level, the site population. But you could also be interested in what's the average treatment effect um, at the level of the person and how much heterogeneity there is and so forth. And so um, it turns out that uh, very uh, specific changes in what you're trying to estimate have uh, very clear implications for how you should uh, not only construct, but how you should scale these weights. And it's my belief that um, if we can get clear on that, uh, we, and then hopefully everybody can get a lot clearer on how to do weighted analysis. So that'll be, probably be the next webinar we do. And then maybe the one after that, by then we'll have the uh, multi, uh, uh, the multiple, the grid search in, in multiple dimensions. That's kind of our, that's our current plan for the next two uh, webinars. So we really appreciate your coming. Um, tune in. I, you know, give feedback. Uh, try this out. Send uh, send criticisms or you know, tell us your experience. I, I, we've been running these on a lot of data sets. They seem to work very well. And uh, but we like your feedback and uh, um, and hope that you'll kind of stay tuned and just stay on board and give us um, give us feedback on this and tell us what we should be looking at. These are things that we think we find important in, in the field. But we, we may have missed something. So I look forward to more engagement with you guys. Thank you very much, Steve. And thank you all for tuning in and attending this webinar. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. So uh, this is the end of the seminar. Thank you very much.